Hello everybody, this is your host Nino and in today's video we shall have a brief look at some important aspects of Ubuntu 22.04 Squiddy Squid or Jamie Jellyfish or whatever else you prefer to call it. Now it's a really nice system which I do enjoy using and I'm sure you will find many other reviews which give you a general overview of it. Here, instead, I shall focus on certain particulars which are relevant if you are using older hardware, just like I do. I'm using an older ThinkPad, which is soon going to be a teenager if it were human. And with that in mind, I stumbled across certain problems which might apply to other people as well. And, well, you will have here a few fringe topics to enjoy. <laughs> And without further ado, the first thing when you are upgrading your computer, and that applies I think to everyone, beware of the installation media because there is no upgrade option and in case you are a newbie, you just might happen to overwrite your existing system because you are not sure what you're doing and you're thinking it is going to, you know, um, respect your previous Ubuntu installation and only to discover that it didn't respect anything and just erased it. So don't do that. Update from within Ubuntu. And in case it doesn't want to do that immediately, as it was the case for me, it might be because you have configured certain um, options in your, for instance, in your DNS. I had, sec I had configured secure DNS and then it couldn't find the update. And when I temporarily turned that off, it found it just fine. So, <laughs> With that in mind, beware what you're doing. The next thing I was immediately facing after installation, and that turned out to be a very big issue for me, was that my computer froze. And as I figured out later, because of overheating. See, computers are paradox. It overheats, that's when it freezes. And the background for this problem is that newer Linux kernels are containing certain optimizations to make the system snappier for older kernel uh, for older chips. And mine is really old. And these optimizations well by and large lead to a greater CPU utilization and forcing the system simply to run on a higher frequency uh, more rapidly and and well, to use more power, which on my laptop y led to nearly immediate overheating. And while I was trying to figure out what was happening, and in particular how I can ameliorate it, I was putting my laptop periodically for some quarter of an hour into the fridge in order to have it cold enough for having a few minutes at the command line to try to see what's, what's up. In my desperation, finally, I found several measures and I wrote a little script, which I shall show you immediately. And this script contains the measures which I undertook in order to keep my computer somewhat cooler. And I do tell you, this does work. And while I'm using a ThinkPad, so this element here using the ThinkFan daemon may be a little bit specific, I think that for other computer models there may be, you know, similar approaches. So let me just walk you through what worked for me. Now first let's look at this line, and I think that is really not dependent on ThinkPad, I think you'll have that on any computer. This here basically is listing your maximum CPU speed for each CPU, like if you want to see just for one, I just showed you for all of them, but you would write here CPU 0, and yeah, that's what it is. And this line is echoing um, just basically one gigahertz as the top speed. So immediately upon booting, my system will then uh, run limcpu.sh and it will limit the, the maximum speed of the system temporarily to about 1 gigahertz. Mine doesn't even go so low to 1 gigahertz, it just goes to 1.2, but still it helps a bit, you know, <laughs> do everything that helps. The other thing which was important is that you are loading the ThinkPad ACPI module like this. And that module, once loaded, will give you certain 
certain virtual devices and folders which you can use in order to further modify your system. Most interesting in our case being the PROC ACPI IBM fan file. And if you look at this thing, you will see that it has a few speed possibilities like options which you can choose uh, from 0 to 7, 0 meaning ventilators off, so immediate overheat, up to full speed which means it blows its mind out. I am using a full speed uh, fan surge for two seconds before I start my normal power, man power management demons in order to get any residual heat out of the system which may have built up during boot time. So that's the first, th that's the second step. So first we limit the processor speed, then we turn on the fan and then there are two programs which I'm using in order to regulate temperature and fan control, one being TLP, the other one being ThinkFan. I haven't yet detected them to be in conflict. They seem to be working together just nicely and um, if you do not have a ThinkPad then at least TLP should serve you well. Now I mentioned that this entire issue is due to certain changes in more recent kernels. So you might wish to boot an older kernel and you have several options of doing that. And the one being holding shift while the machine boots and all the time picking your kernel manually. Well, something you will not want to do very long. The other option being that you uninstall all other kernels uh, except the one you would like to use. Yeah, but what happens if an update happens in the future that you would like to apply and where these issues get fixed, which I trust eventually they will, because this is not the first time this problem crops up. Yeah, then it would be actually nice to have the other kernels, right? So the solution I found, long story short, is, uh, let, let me show you, VETC default Grub is to fixate the system on Grub boot level to have a preferred bootable kernel, which works now a bit differently than generally shown in the tutorials. Well, originally you're having a stop line this one, Grub default is equal to zero, which means the first selection and that means your newest kernel, which might be exactly not the one you want. If you would put here any other number, it would select a kernel further down the line. That would work uh, only until you install some further kernels so that the line numbering gets messed up and a kernel is booted that you wouldn't want to. So setting the number is pointless. Setting the name is what is generally recommended and that is what I did, namely you put in there essentially the exact name that you see in the group selection menu. And that is what I did. But the moment I updated Grub, it cried at me that this mode of doing things is deprecated yet again and that some other way to do things is recommended, namely to take this monstrosity of a uh, kernel identification line and to use that for the kernel to be booted. I copied it, I pasted it, now I'm using that and I tell you it works flawlessly. So. If you are doing that, just first try with the normal name you would like and then it's going to tell you what the actual name should be and then you can just take that and set it in here. And now no matter what kernel is being installed on that system, my computer will be booting 5.13 rather than for instance the highly problematic 5.15 and it will allow me to test things manually until I find a suitable newer kernel which will not cause overheating. And you know one should take that sort of seriously because once your computer starts to freeze up immediately, I mean yeah you can boot it with external media and whatnot, but it's such a fuss so better stay with something which just works, right? So we have now seen how to find, fight the overheating. Uh, just one final element left to that and it concerns the graphical user environment. See, right now I am using X11 because I simply prefer X11. I uh, always have done so. I was never a particularly great fan of Wayland. And 
Wayland also contributed to my screen randomly freezing and I remember that it was doing that in Ubuntu 20.04.2 just not as badly as here. Here I could like with a guarantee have a screen freeze in some 10-15 minutes so that made my computer unusable. In order to handle that situation you just log out you know and then <coughs> as you are logging in again, you just click on your name which will be at the center of the screen. You do not yet enter your password. At the lower right corner will appear a little toothed wheel. When you click on it a menu will pop up and on that menu it will show you that you can actually run another session. And there I pick X11 session. And then you enter your password and that's it. From then on you are entering into an X11 session as soon as you enter your um, desktop. So that sounds great, but it had one catch. If I were to stay away from the keyboard for about a minute, the screen would become a little bit dimmer. And that included the possibility that I... Uh, no, not that. <laughs> that included the possibility that I have set here in the power options that I don't want that, you know, like when you look here at things, uh, where are the power options? Come on, I want to be, be civil. Ah, there you have it, power. Right, and here you're having this option of dim screen, and I turned it off duly, like do not dim my screen, just leave my screen in peace, just let it always be on, um, including on battery, including on AC power. Yeah, but nonetheless I was facing endless screen dimming adventures. So what I did was to find a way to fix this aside from the graphical user interface. First thing I tried was um, handling it with X set options. Like X set is a X11 program which is normally handling such settings, but it was ignored. And my conclusion was that this is something GNOME specific. And hence I was afraid that if I now, you know, change something in GNOME somewhere, that an update will come and will ruin whatever I did. And therefore I was searching for some more permanent solution. And lo and behold, I found a great GNOME extension called Espresso, which seems to be a derivative of caffeine, which in its turned off form looks like that that will eventually dim my screen, but if I uh, let it steam then my screen stays reliably on. And that is indeed the solution to have your screen on and to have everything you know working nicely. Um, but installing that GNOME extension turned out to be a bigger odyssey than one would assume. For if you now click on your nice new snap based Firefox and try to go to the GNOME extensions page. Ah, Firefox, what is the matter? Seriously. Just, you know, just run. It's not so difficult, you can do that, my dear. <laughs> okay, Firefox is now apparently in some sort of strike. Ah no, here we are. So if you go to the Espresso GNOME ex extensions, then yeah, that is if you ever reach that page, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, just let me let me fix this because it is ah there we are, espresso gnome shell extension. If you go there or to caffeine for that matter, then you get this warning. Although GNOME Shell integration extension is running, native host connector is not detected. At first I was puzzled because I had gotten this to work in the past. But then the thing is that now my Firefox is snap based. So it is isolated from the rest of the system and hence cannot serve to install your nice GNOME extension. What to do in such a case? Well, go over to the mozilla.org page and just simply get the tar bz2 for Firefox. That's going to give you a rather big um, folder with Firefox inside, like there isn't anything to install, you just need to run it. And once you do that, 
you will have a Firefox with full system access and then you can install the GNOME extensions. I just to show you, I hope I'll find it swiftly, but on that low resolution it might be more difficult than usually. So, yeah, uh, I don't know, explore Firefox. And yeah, let's say browsers, Firefox for desktop, okay. And it should figure out that you're here on Linux. And if I say now download Firefox, I'll just download the browser. And there we go. So it is such a file with a tar bz2 extension, which when you when you get it and when you extract it, you will see that it contains a normal Firefox by way of which you can navigate to the GNOME extensions page and then get Espresso and whatever other extensions you w would like to have. Because at first it can be very puzzling why it suddenly doesn't work. Yeah, and uh, what shall I say? That's about the main stumbling stones along the way of getting one's Ubuntu 22.04 desktop to run on an older machine. And now that we have handled the, let's call it, sensible part of this video, let's have a little bit of enjoyable nonsense. See, I was like thinking, look how far we have come. This is a really nice, absolutely usable system. And then I was thinking, you know, about this progression from from X11 to Wayland and I remembered about an old friend of mine which I may have already demonstrated to you namely an emulator of the AT&T Unix PC from the 1980s. Now that used to be a moderate machine which cost about as much as a car right like some $18,000 <laughs> and was one of those systems that you could get. It doesn't seem to be that what many people have been getting, for if I read old forums I really find mostly discussions along the lines of Minix versus Coherent, Coherent apparently being the more recommended system, whereas Minix being more research oriented. But if you wanted to have a, so to say, real machine and you didn't have the money for a Sun or something like that, you may have been using something along these lines. And I got a while ago a great emulator, which I, I'm not sure I may have shown already. It's called Freebie and it's uh, made by some gentleman named Phil, Phil Pemberton and his colleagues. You can find it here on GitHub. I can only say the best about this emulator and the best about these guys. They're extremely helpful and answer all questions and truly hope, uh, truly try that you enjoy their system. I must say a great project which I very much support. And anyway, that emulator is letting you run that AT&T Unix PC from the 80s and I thought you might wish to see how how things looked over then. Now the only thing I'll be doing is that I want to start that without the scaling because I have changed my resolution and if I start it now with the scaling then it will not be able to show the entire screen so just bear with me while I start it up. And there we go. And when you look at that thing, you can compare your modern Ubuntu system and no matter how old your computer is, and even if it's like a dozen years old like mine, you will feel as if you have a superb machine. Notice that it has 4 megabytes of RAM. And indeed, I mean, early Linux could also run in even 2 megabytes of RAM, but what struck my what struck my mind when I read that was that Windows 3.1 or Windows 3.0 at the time could actually run already very reasonable versions of Word and Excel and of similar software 
graphically in a sort of more idiot safe way on machines with similar and even possibly worse specs than this one. So looking at that, that's perhaps not not even all that impressive, right? This is a time when they were apparently counting on the power of a computer and its facilities to connect to mainframes and mini computers rather than on the machine itself. I have no other explanation why it looks like it does look. Now I will log in as install and you'll see what I mean. Yeah, that's the graphical user environment then. And it's not X11, it's something proprietary, it's something very own. And you can see it even here on the controls that I'm having. So I'm closing the window on the lower left. I can move it around on the upper left. And I could resize it, if I wanted to, <laughs> on the lower right. So that's not <laughs> that's not how how X11 does it, that's not how anything does it apart from this little machine here. Like uh, I think maybe there was some experimental ports elsewhere, but it wasn't it wasn't a very common thing to apparently have a graphical user interface on the Unix system in the 80s, I guess. Like you apparently could do it, but really didn't have to, in particular on lower powered machines. And what you can do here is, yeah, you can run <laughs> different programs. You have access to the oh-so-amazing Unix system, and you even can have a full-screen Unix, but I'll press rather right here, because that will open it in its own window. And I can, you know, run multiple applications at the same time. And I can even run my basic interpreter. I should be able to... Ah, it got its own screen, okay. So 10 print. Uh, let's say 1. And if I say run, 1. Haha, <laughs> very funny. And now I'm going to say, what was it, system or buy? System. Yes, system. And I'm back in my original environment. And the needs of people seem to have been modest. What I read is, uh, does it have... Uh, an ANSI C compiler. You're like sort of thinking, who doesn't? But when you think of it in these earlier days, that seems to have been something something special, right? There are discussions about editors, this or that. Nowadays we have so many editors on our systems that we have even forgotten about them and, and aren't even sure which one uh, which ones we even have installed already. But I did find a very nice one. Should you get into using this emulator, I can recommend the Easy Editor used by FreeBSD to this day if I'm not entirely mistaken. See this is actually rather nice. Uh, I can type here, I can say Hello there, from the easy editor. And if I wanted to, you know, quit editing, I just press escape and then I get a menu. And I can pick file operations, I can get help, ch change settings and so on. If I say leave editor, it will still make sure I do nothing stupid, so it asks me to save the changes or not. I'll say no save. And yeah, I got here a couple of Lisp systems because I made myself at home. Believe it or not, but when I am emulating a system, I take so much care of it as if I am installing my actual desktop. Like as if I am bound to make a time trip, time travel trip and now have to use this machine for, for three years or something. So I did get xlisp. Right, that that's nice, <laughs> and and would work um, exactly as you would assume that it does. How did I get out of there? Was it with exit? Yes, but more interestingly, I got AKCL. This is Austin Kyoto Common Lisp, and Austin Kyoto Common Lisp, a derivative of Kyoto Common Lisp, is a grandfather of a lot of present Lisp systems, some of which are even available on your mobile phones. AKCL is first of all the grandfather of GCL, GNU Common Lisp. It is also an ancestor to SBCL, 
which is like steel bank common lisp i would say nowadays likely the leading free common lisp implementation but it is also the ancestor to ecl the embeddable common lisp which you can I believe install both on Android and on iOS on your mobile phone right now in case you are in the mood. So <laughs> that's pretty amazing to you know like look into the past that way. And yeah, let's let's just try that. Let's just give it a test run. Huh, doesn't want to. Okay, five and and nine. Great. And now there's one funny thing about AKCL. You cannot exit it through quit and you cannot exit it through exit. Of course you can cheat and use control D which will exit it, but you're supposed to exit it through buy like some 1970s basic. So yeah, that was a simple life, right? What was also interesting is that you had to pick what shell you're having and that it was a bit of a question of how much memory you're having. Like you never think about s such things nowadays. I'm running here bin sh, which is primitive by all measures, but I of course got also bash. Ah, the life. Anyway, <laughs> so you got a brief demonstration of that and these were the simple happinesses which people could enjoy at the time then and I shall now s shut down the system and as I do so which is which ah, first I need to become root yeah nothing very good and then I say shut down was it H T zero like halt and with no time in the future? <sighs> yes, excellent. So that's it. And then I will show you what we have nowadays in comparison, right? Now first let's get to the desktop. I have planned something particularly depraved for you. Namely, see I have installed wine. You know, this um, program environment that lets you run a lot of Windows programs by now. And wine offers, let me just find it briefly, yeah offers the possibility to run its command com or cmdx actually. It's the same cmdx that you are used from Windows, right? So if I now say now dir, I get a dir. <laughs> if I am um, saying type test asm to dump some assembly program I have written a while ago, yeah, that's what it does. It behaves exactly the way you would expect it to do. And there is even something something even stranger which is possible with it. Namely, to use the con console special file. It does not work, unfortunately, to say copy con and hello text. But what does work is to redirect it. And <laughs> welcome to one of the most uh, primitive text entry systems of all times, which works on basically any system. You just have to look at the specific commands to accomplish that. So here I can type some text and greet you kindly. Right, and normally I would terminate that with a control Z, but if I press control Z here, it's just going to suspend everything. And while a little bit inelegant, I'm going to use control C to stop it, but I still should be having a hello text. And I do. Now, I can also run PowerShell, which you can nowadays install on Linux all the same. And if I say get content 
hello text it will do just what you would expect it to do whoopsie yeah control D did it and <laughs> it died anyway uh, while it is not dead it is working yeah <laughs> like most things in life so I tell you Linux has become a really interesting system which allows you to run things and to enjoy even quite foreign systems in an utterly comfortable way and there isn't really anything that one could have expected of it to develop that way like I must say I got surprised how Linux became such a nice system you know <laughs> having had a look at it from the beginning so with that I can clearly recommend you to try that out I kindly thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you found one or the other entertaining or useful thing in it I hope you will join me soon as a guest again I wish you a wonderful day and I wish you Goodbye.